Hi there. Uh, Tim O'Reilly, I'm the founder and CEO of O'Reilly Media, uh, the computer book publisher, conference producer, and uh, venture capitalist. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, my history with uh, digital books. Um, uh, I too was uh, moved by HyperCard. My company's first online book was actually a, a version of a technical book for HyperCard. Uh, we didn't look back. We started working uh, pretty actively trying to figure out how to get our books online in uh, 1980s, from 1987 on. Uh, and interestingly, our quest to build a platform for digital book publishing uh, led us very early to the World Wide Web. Uh, we uh, were uh, built actually the, the first, uh, one of the first graphical web browsers, uh, Viola. Uh, was out of the, uh, UC Berkeley. We adopted it and, and uh, hired the creator and worked uh, to build a platform which we called GNN, the Global Network Navigator, because we realized that there was all this new content being created that was not in books. Uh, so we also were the first site on the web uh, to uh, discover the advertising business model. And uh, that was sort of uh, something I inflicted on the world. <laughs> and. Uh, Although my, my notion of what the advertising was was the site itself, you know, so you think now if you go to O'Reilly.com, it's the kind of thing that you used to get in the mail. It's a catalog, you know, um, and with lots of content in support of commerce. Um, but the, uh, you know, we went on uh, to continue to work with ebooks in 2000. Uh, I launched a, a, a technical book subscription service called Safari Books Online. Uh, which now has uh, hundreds of thousands of subscribers, uh, started publishing ebooks uh, standalone uh, around the same time. Uh, ebooks are now a pretty major part of our business. And one of the things that probably has distinguished us from most other publishers in that regard is we've insisted from the beginning that our books be DRM free. Uh, you know, when we wouldn't even sell them to Amazon uh, unless uh, they agreed for them to be DRM. And, uh, at this point, we sell our what we sell is sort of an ebook bundle. You can get your books. Once you buy a book from us, you can buy it uh, in EPUB, in Mobi, in uh, you know any other format, including Daisy. You can get any or all. Uh, and uh, one of the things that we found from that is that it's really increased our market. Uh, it's it's amazing. Uh, we're now selling books uh, in countries around the world where we were never we were never able to reach uh, uh, with physical books. Uh, you know, our, so we maxed out at about 30% uh, of our book sales in, internationally with print. Uh, we're at about 60% uh, international with ebooks. So it's actually, and, and, and we, we continue to hear that uh, DRM free is incredibly valuable to our customers. But that kind of, uh, you know, leads me to a couple of, of big uh, issues that I think we all need to think about when we think about the future of books and the future of the library. First off, uh, the term book itself is under uh, tremendous transformation. Uh, there are entire classes of books that will never be produced again as books. And we don't know how far that's going to go. I mean, what's the need for an atlas or a dictionary as a printed book uh, when you can deliver the same service, the same job for the user so much more effectively with an application? Uh, even Fiction, you might think, well, gosh, how can you do that, uh, you know, without that wonderful magic of, you know, immersive reading? But of course, if you think uh, about the job that it does for a reader, uh, there's probably more in common between World of Warcraft and Harry Potter than between Harry Potter and the Encyclopedia Britannica. Uh, so we have to free ourselves from the notion that this body of jobs that we do for readers that was for so many uh, centuries bound together by the form of the printed book will continue to hold. And we have to realize that there are going to be divergent paths for many of the jobs that authors and publishers do for readers. And that we're going to need different strategies uh, for solving um, all of those things. Uh, another uh, lesson that I want to um, Actually, I should go back to my own business. You know, we publish technical manuals, technical books of various kinds, and we've seen a huge shift. We don't publish anything in print that's reference-oriented at all anymore. You know, we used to sell tens of thousands of copies a month of certain kinds of reference books, and we don't 
we said we've just don't even publish them because the web is just better at reference. But I want to mention another point. Uh, going back to GNN, that first commercial website from uh, early 1993, there are no copies of it online. Uh, we were there before uh, Brewster had his brilliant idea of the Internet Archive. And so I, I look back at that early history, and, and somebody was asking me, well, what were those first web at? What did they look like? And frankly, it was amazing. None of us could remember. We eventually found uh, you know, somewhere in our you know, ephemera a copy of a brochure that had a picture. And you know, I just want to emphasize just how important it is for us to think about digital preservation in the context of the library. And uh, I, uh, so much of the creative output of our society is now digital. It's not in the form uh, that we have expected it so long, the sort of the, the book as the document of record. And uh, unless we get on with the job of preservation, and that also means incredibly, you know, curation at uh, much earlier in the process because there's so much information, we're probably not going to keep it all. You know, I have my own personal archive, and I used to just point links to things, uh, and now I find uh, how many of my old links are, are, are dead. And I go, wow, I actually have to suck down a copy, keep it, if I want to even keep a record of my own intellectual output, let alone that of others. So I think uh, there's a real job for DPLA to emphasize what are the best practices of digital preservation. But then you have to think about how do you do that in a distributed way? Because I don't think it's possible for one organization to archive everything, uh, even though Brewster's done a pretty damn good job. Uh, you know, it's, it's a scale problem. So we actually have to think about what does distributed preservation look like? What are the obligations of people to keep copies? And there's some real lessons in software because software is one of the great intellectual outputs of our age. And we see an amazing set of tools for not only uh, allow, allowing collaborative development, collaborative consumption, uh, but also archiving. Archiving is built right into most modern software. You use a platform like GitHub, uh, you're actually uh, keeping copies of every version at the same time as you're making it accessible. And I think it's really worth uh, having the DPLA study uh, you know, how software is distributed, created, and shared uh, today. Uh, I also think that it's, it's really critical uh, to think through um, search. Uh, back uh, when, at the height of the Google Books controversy, uh, I wrote an op-ed called Book Search Should Work Like Web Search. You know, we have this notion that somehow it's all going to be in one place. I think what we really have to start thinking about is, you know, how we can leverage the distributed nature of the Internet, uh, find what's out there, uh, establish standards for how people advertise uh, what they've got, and above all, keep it in open formats that are actually uh, linkable to. The big challenge of eBooks today is that they're increasingly being uh, produced in proprietary formats under the control of a single company, and uh, that is going to be a real challenge for the future uh, of open access. Thank you.